Welcome, everybody, to Grace Fellowship Baptist Church. We are so happy and so honored to be able to serve you this Sunday morning. Amen. We just want to take a minute to remember this is 9-11, so we do want to think about all those who perished in the attacks on 9-11, and definitely want to say a big, big thank you to all of our first responders who go running into danger when everybody else is running away. So please just uh, remember this day in prayer, remember the families and all of the first responders in prayer today. Also, we want to let you guys know that we are in the midst of our Mary Hill Davis offering. Now, this is a big one for us because this is specifically for Texas missions. So we love to give to this and support Texas missions. 100% of what you donate does go directly to the mission field. We are in the week of prayer this week, and if you'll notice in your bulletin, there are some prayer guides that Susan was kind enough to include in there for you. So you can look through there and see uh, all of the different things that you can be praying for this week. And we have collected $25 so far. We just started, so that's just our beginning. We know that it is going to dramatically increase each Sunday as, as we go. So thank you, and just pray about how God leads you to give to this offering. Also, we want to remind you that we are trying to replace half of the windows upstairs. The total cost to do that is $2,800. And so far, we've collected $1,275. So that's really good. That's, we're almost halfway there. So again, it, all we ask is just that you pray and ask God how he would lead you to donate to that. 
We do have a men's fish fry that is coming up in October at Riverbend Retreat. Uh, it should be a lot of fun, so if any of the men are interested in going, it's October 4th, and it's only $10. They just ask a very minimal amount to help cover expenses for doing that fish fry. If you are interested in going, just let Dale Stiegler know, and uh, we'll see about putting something together for the men. Also, if you'll look in your bulletins, you'll see that there are some save the dates coming up for November. Believe it or not, um, the holidays are right around the corner. And we have a lot going on here at the church that we wanted everybody to be aware of so you can all participate. We've got November 13th is a Sunday, and that is going to be the fall festival and fall concert. And Brother Bill and the Praise Team are going to bring you guys a beautiful, worshipful experience at that concert. It's going to be great. And then we're going to have uh, a, a big uh, uh, brew over who's going to win the baked goods competition. So you definitely do not want to miss that. Also, on November 18th, 19th, and 20th, that's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we are going to have our revival and that Saturday the 19th, we are going to have a Thanksgiving potluck here at the church right after that revival session. So be thinking about that. And also on November 26th, believe it or not, that is going to be the hanging of the greens. And we are going to decorate the church and make it beautiful for Christmas. So just kind of put these on your calendar, have them in the back of your mind and be thinking about them. And uh, be in prayer for um, all of our church family who is traveling. We have quite a bit who are traveling right now. So just keep them in prayer for safe travels. And I'm going to turn this back over to our awesome praise team. Brother Frank, would you start us out with uh, just a quick uh, word of prayer for 9-11? Sure. Almighty Father, we do re remember on this day uh, the horror that it was. We do ask that you'd bring comfort because you are the comforter that uh, so many people will remember this day in terror and fear and horror. That you would comfort them. We do appreciate that uh, you have us in a well-ordered society where there are people that are willing to risk their life and give their life to try to keep people safe. Uh, police officers, firefighters, ambulance, uh, other people that are first responders in various capacities, and those that direct them, uh, that uh, manage call centers and stuff, that work so hard and diligently that day, and do so even day-to-day -day basis in sm tragedies small and large. Lord, we appreciate them. Even as this week we depended upon them, that, uh, Lord, you still provide for us, that uh, people still will risk themselves to save others. Lord, uh, we ask that you continue to be with this country. We ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to convict us, that we would humble ourselves and pray and turn and seek your face and turn from our wicked way so that you can bless this land once again. In your holy name, amen.
Would you please stand for the reading of God's Word? This morning, our scripture reading comes from the book of Isaiah, the 43rd chapter, starting in verse 18. Would you read with me, please? Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. You may be seated. Almighty Father, you are the one that makes a way that brings us from where we were in our sins to righteousness in you. It's not our righteousness, but it is your son's righteousness imputed to us. Lord, thank you for that, that you love us enough to give us grace and mercy when we don't deserve it, but you do anyway. That you had a plan for salvation and you brought it to pass. Lord, have us to be your workers here on earth, that we will proclaim your name, your mighty acts, and the salvation that you bring until your son returns in your almighty name amen <laughs>
As we go into our stewardship portion of the service today, we are still, uh, to me, celebrating the Mary Hill Davis uh, emphasis during uh, the month of September. And today we have another film that I want to show you that uh, illustrates what uh, this organization is doing for our state. Hello, Texas Baptist family. My name is David Miranda, and I want to thank you so much for your prayers and support for the Mary Hill Davis offering. Thanks to your contribution, we're able to create programs such as Devoted, which are meant to gather young adults from across the state and to bring them into Texas Baptist life. Once in community, they're able to strengthen one another and support each other in their calling. We've also been able to partner with the WMU to create a program called Embrace, which is a young adult women mentorship program. This program is meant to strengthen young women who are interested in being part of ministry and to resource them and equip them to mission projects and other ministry opportunities. So once again, thank you so much for your support for the Mary Hill Davis offering. We can't do this alone. And in fact, we're better together. So let's go share Christ and show his love. The, uh, the theme for this Mary Hill Davis is I am Texas Missions. And what that means is that we are God's feet. We, you know, even though we may be small, but we can still share God's word. And so what we want to do uh, this week, you have those handouts that give uh, uh, a certain area to pray for and they're quite handy because they're perforated. You can break them off and just keep one with you uh, throughout the day that you can look at or put it on your refrigerator to remind you, uh, you know, uh, for, you know, what to pray for that day. But we need to pray that we can tell someone about Jesus. That's the key thing. And pray that the Mary Hill Davis will be out there helping others to hear about Jesus. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we have for our stewardship, because that, that means not just uh, investing financially in the church and in getting God's word out, but it means that we are stewards of your word, Lord, because we are commanded to go tell. And we just thank you, Lord, that we live in a land where we can go out and share your word with others. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Today we are completing this series on uh, the always God. And we've seen how, how he is always with us, always watching us and listening to us. Today we are going to learn that God is always restoring. Now, when I say restore, a lot of times that will bring up um, different mind pictures. In other words, for example, if you're into carpentry or antiques, you may think about restoring a piece of furniture. Or uh, if you watch uh, the series on PBS called This Old House, you'll think of restoring old homes to their original charm. Well, Today, we're going to look and see what it means for God to restore. Because when, when it comes to God, I think about the work that he does to restore humanity to its original factory condition, which tells me that there's just no rest for the weary. You know, think about it. God is always restoring. There's no project too big. There's no project too broken. There's no project too far gone for him to tackle. Now, our scripture passage this morning illustrates this beauty, beautifully. We're in Isaiah. So if you want to turn to Isaiah 61, I'm going to read verses 1 to 4. It says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the cat captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Do you see everything that God's doing here or going to be doing? But what you need to focus on is that little passage in verse 2, a little phrase where Isaiah said, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, a lot of times we just skip over that. We read the passage and keep on going. But what does Isaiah mean about the year of the Lord's favor? You know, what was he referencing? Well, in order to get into his mind, you need a little background information. Now, Isaiah ministered in the southern kingdom of Judah from approximately 740 B.C. to about 681 B.C. At that time, the northern kingdom had already been wiped away because Assyria had come in. Now, when this happened, when Assyria came through and wiped out the northern kingdom, Isaiah was... Uh, in his early 20s. And through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Isaiah knew that the day was coming when Judah, the southern kingdom, would also be overrun and carried off to exile, which actually happened about 586. Now, that's about a century after Isaiah had died. So Isaiah is prophesying here. He's writing to a people who are stressed out 
They're anxious. They can see the enemy at their gates. They know what's happening in their nation. There probably were some senior citizens in town shaking their heads, saying, I just don't know what this world is coming to. I never thought I'd see the day when the Assyrians could just march in and take over. You know, it's, it's no different than today, what people are saying. So here's Isaiah prophesying that there'll come a day when the one whom God anoints will make things right again. You know, you know <laughs> I think about that phrase, make things right again. It's a catchy little phrase, and I've, I've heard something like that used recently, but, you know, I digress there. You know, this one, the one, the anointed one by God, he's going to preach good news to the poor. He'll heal the brokenhearted. He'll proclaim liberty to captives. And he'll proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, for the Jew, this year of the Lord's favor referred specifically to something God created back in Leviticus called the year of Jubilee. Now, according to Leviticus 25, every 50 years, Israel was to get a reset. All debts were to be forgiven. Hebrew slaves were to be set free. Land that had been sold was to revert back to its original owners. Also, for the entire year, the land was to rest from planning so the people could rely on the Lord's provision. The idea of this year of Jubilee was to keep the playing field level where everyone was, was okay. There wouldn't be any inherited wealth. But then again, there wouldn't be any generational debt either. No one would be born into slavery and every generation would get a reboot. Now, here's something that I think sad and tragic, but also, you know, predictable when you think about it, when you think about, you know, we as, as human beings, there's no evidence that the year of Jubilee was ever observed, even though God had created it. We know it couldn't have been observed after the time of Isaiah because after the fall of the Northern Kingdom in 722 and the exile of the Southern Kingdom in 586, the boundaries of the 12 tribes no longer existed. But there is no mention of this observance anywhere in Joshua when Israel conquered and settled the promised land. There's no mention of it in the time of the judges or at any time during the, the, um, uh, during the divided monarchy. So after the decree was laid out in Leviticus, it just sort of goes away. It's never mentioned again, aside from a, a casual reference to its fulfillment in the book of Numbers. You know, think, think about it. You know, th this, it, it would be nice to have, but think about the repercussions of celebrating the year of Jubilee every 50 years today. You know, our entire financial system would collapse if all debt were canceled every 50 years. Can you imagine giving Manhattan back to the Indians? How about giving most of Tennessee and Kentucky and parts of Alabama, Georgia and the Carolinas back to the Cherokees? What if every farmer let their land lay fallow for an entire year, trusting that the Lord would provide? You see, most people would write off the Jubilee as impractical. 
idealistic, unattainable. You know, yet Isaiah prophesied that the year of the Lord's favor was coming. Yeah. How could that be? You know, our world's just too broken, too complicated, too selfish, too sinful. Now notice that Isaiah didn't simply stop with restoring society to its factory setting. According to verse 3, anyone who was mourning would be given a beautiful headdress. You know, something similar to, to what, what a bride would wear. Instead of ashes, you know, that's uh, you know, what a widow would originally put on their forehead there would be gladness instead of mourning. In other words, funeral homes would be empty and dance halls would be filled. People would wear garments of praise instead of a faint spirit. Instead of meekness and timidity and lack of self-assurance, people would be strutting around in their best New Year's Eve party tuxedos. You know, the citizens of this restored Zion would be called oaks of righteousness, a planning of the Lord. They would be walking definitions of a godly man and woman. Just like Psalms 1 describes, a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. You know, think about that. You know, cities that had been devastated for generations would be rebuilt and repaired. Ruins would become sanctuaries. You know, it, it's a beautiful picture of restoration and, and renewal. When this anointed one comes, we won't be as good as new. We'll be better than new. The goal won't be to make everything how it used to be. Instead, the anointed one will make everything like it never had a chance to be. Now, we've never seen things restored to their original factory condition. Because all we have known is a world after the fall, after sin entered the world. How, how could this restoration that uh, uh, Isaiah is talking about even be possible? You know, we're too broken. You know, and this is what sin did to us. It corrupted us. It marred us. It broke the relationship between God and humanity. What does Romans 3.23 tell us? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Left to ourselves, there's no way that our world could ever be restored to mint condition. But let me tell you, there, there is some good news. Now, as we leave Isaiah's time frame, let's fast forward about 600 years to a Saturday morning in a tiny backwater village called Nazareth in southern Galilee where a local boy named Jesus was invited to read the designated scripture passage for the synagogue liturgy. Well, when he stood up, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. He enrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. This is recorded in Luke 4, 18 to 19. He read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, 
to set at liberty those who are opposed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And right there in front of that hometown crowd, in front of the little old women who used to change his diapers in the nursery, in front of the guys he ran track with in high school. The Bible says that Jesus rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Think about it. Can you just hear the buzz that went through that crowd? Did he just say that the scripture has been fulfilled? Did he just say this is the year of the Lord's favor? Is this really the jubilee? You know, the, the Israelites had been living under Roman occupation for roughly a hundred years by this point. Was it possible that God was about to perform a factory reset? And there's something else here too. If the people had been listening closely and knew their Old Testament, they would have picked up on two differences between what Isaiah wrote and what Jesus read. For one thing, Jesus stopped just before he got to the line that said, the day of vengeance of our God. Jesus was well aware of how much the people in his day were looking for a political Messiah that would lead a military insurrection against these ungodly Romans. So he wisely tamped down that phrase, the day of vengeance. But notice what Jesus substitutes in his proclamation that wasn't part of Isaiah's prophecy. Jesus said, he came so that the blind could recover their sight. That's not in Isaiah's original prophecy. For the majority of Jesus' miracles, you can point to someone in the Old Testament that did something similar. You know, just think about some of his miracles, like uh, the multiplication of food when Jesus fed the 5,000. Well, there was a miraculous multiplication of food when Moses led the children of Israel through the wilderness. Manna fell from heaven. Quail dropped from the sky. Or what about the times that Jesus demonstrated a miraculous control of nature when he calmed the storm or when he walked on water? Well, Moses parted the Red Sea. Joshua crossed the Jordan River on dry ground. What about when Jesus raised the dead? Well, Elijah did the same thing. You know, Jesus healed leprosy. So did Elisha. But let this sink in. There's no story in the Old Testament about anyone being cured, <clears throat> being cured of blindness. Yet there's at least seven instances and possibly eight of Jesus healing the blind here in the New Testament. When Jesus preached his inaugural sermon, he told his hometown crowd that recovery of sight to the blind would be one of the signs that God had anointed him. Yeah. Even John, the Baptist, when he was in prison, he began to wonder if Jesus really was the anointed Messiah. So he sent a couple of his disciples to ask him. In John 11, 2 to 5, we see this. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, 
Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. And the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. What was the first thing out of Jesus' mouth? Tell John that the blind are receiving their sight. This was the sign that God was doing something through Jesus that had never been done before. Of all the miracles Jesus ever did, the one in John 9 where Jesus healed a man born blind stirred up the most controversy. You know, the, the, his, his neighbors, the blind man's neighbors wanted to know what happened. So the man told them, John 9, 11, he replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash and I went and washed, and then I could see. And then the Pharisees launched their investigation. So they asked him, how come you're not blind anymore? And the man gave him the same answer. It says, therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. Well, he put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. But, you know, what the issue was with the Pharisees, they, they weren't excited about that. They didn't care if the man had regained sight. They were only concerned that Jesus had done this on the Sabbath. They were concerned because making mud pies was work, and work was forbidden on the Sabbath. You know, it, they, they sort of missed the point. Then they asked his parents about whether or not their son, you know, was actually born blind. Then they brought the man back in for more questioning. And the man gave him, a, gave him the fourth verse of amazing grace. He says, one thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. And they asked him a third time how it happened. And by this time, he's getting just a little testy. Verse 27, he answered, I've told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become a disciple too? You know, why does this miracle get so much attention? Simple, it had never happened before. The man who was born blind pointed this out to the Pharisees in John 9, 32. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. Jesus didn't merely come to make everything the way it was. Jesus came to make things like they had never been. True restoration and renewal aren't going to come through political or military processes. It's not going to come by politicians who promise to get the country back to traditional values. No, true restoration and renewal can only come through Jesus. Isaiah predicted this when he said in Isaiah 43, 19, that God would do a new thing. You know, don't get stuck on former things. Don't get hung up on the way things used to be. You know, God's talking about something new here. Isaiah 43, 18 to 19, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. 
Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. You know what another word for favor is? Is grace. Grace restores what's broken. Grace releases what's bound. Grace removes what uh, renews what's lifeless. Grace rebuilds what's ruined. Grace opens blind eyes. Jesus did it for the blind man. And you know what? He does it for us too. He can be our jubilee. He can forgive our debts and set us free. You know, here's how he did it for the blind man. You know, the blind man had been rejected by religion. The legalistic, self-righteous Pharisees did everything they could do to shame and ridicule him. John 9, 34. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. And this is where Jesus found him. Thrown out. Cast aside. Rejected. John 9, 35 to 38. It says, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe? In the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. So the question today is the same Do you believe in the Son of Man? Do you believe that there is someone who loves you, who cherishes you, who has always pursued you, who gave his life for you, who is able to restore you? Someone who is always speaking to you and in fact is speaking to you now. If so, this is the time to open your eyes. Seeing, you know, maybe even for the first time. Believe in him. Worship him. And be restored. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come to you today, we recognize that you are restoring us. And we thank you, Lord, that you sent your son who would know the pain and the hurt that we go through every day. And we just ask, Lord, that you help us to hear you when you talk to us, to see you around us, to know that you are pursuing us in order that we may be restored to something completely different, to something better than new. And we lift you up, Lord, thanking you for all that you are doing in our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.